The cell membrane took some time to gain the respect it deserved. In 1870, it was stated that the membrane belonged so little to the cell that it might even be considered a sign of degradation. It was only at the end of the 19th century that it was recognized as an envelope vital to the cell's survival. In 1925, Evert Gorter, a Dutch pediatrician working on red blood cells, proved that the membrane was made up of a double or bilayer of lipids. The biophysicist Danielian Dawson claimed that proteins were associated with both sides of this lipid bilayer. These proteins captured and filtered the elements that were necessary to keep the cell alive. Certain small molecules passed through the membrane, while other larger ones attached themselves to receptors, which transmitted signals to the interior of the cell. Our ideas concerning the structure of the membrane are constantly evolving. Cell membranes, two-dimensional liquids. In fact, most of the activities in cells take place in membranes. 30% of the genome encodes integral membrane proteins, but many of the other proteins spend some time at membranes to do their work. And this is really a frontier of the future, because we know very little about this. And it's a very exciting area. Because here you have now a cell membrane. We already knew 1925 that this cell membrane is composed of a, of a two-dimensional system with two lipid leaflets. And we know that this two-dimensional system is a liquid. So this table here is very solid. But a cell membrane would be fluid. And it would be extremely thin, only five nanometers at this fluid is not homogeneous. It has a structure, a lateral organization, where small rafts are swimming around. Lipid rafts, they are not rafts like logs, because they're fluid. It's a fluid-fluid system. A fluid here and a, a fluid raft. And these rafts contain uh, uh, proteins. I mean, proteins are sitting on them as passengers, and they're moving around. They are so small that they are really depositories for these proteins. If protein this protein wants to see this protein, and they are in different rafts. Then you have to get them together in a raft clustering process. And then you form this platform, a reaction chamber in the membrane, which then these meet, and then they do their work. And they can do work in, in signaling. I mean, hormones are binding to, to cell surface receptors, or growth factors are binding to cell surface receptors. And then you get the raft clustering process. A signal goes into the cell and it then uh, gives a response. And a cell surface would contain up to 10, 10 to 30 million proteins. So you understand, only 10 proteins in each raft. That means that each raft is different, like here. They all are different in composition. And this is all regulated by interactions where the lipids play an important role. Uh, so here we have to understand how these membranes work. How can the membrane form these so-called rafts? Of the balance? Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, but it's not really can one look out my mm. They are really obese. Mm. Looks pretty clear. <laughs> Je travaille aussi sur les rafts, ou ce qu'on appelle radeaux lipidiques en français. Et en fait, moi j'étudie particulièrement euh, une, euh, un groupe particulier de radeaux lipidiques qui sont les cavéolés. Ces cavéolés sont en fait des invaginations de la membrane plasmique qui sont composées principalement de la protéine cavéoline. Nous voudrions savoir quel est le rôle de la cavéoline dans euh, l'entrée des graisses dans la cellule. Nous avons généré des souris qui sont génétiquement modifiées et qui ne peuvent pas fabriquer la protéine cavéoline. Et donc on peut même peser les souris et voir déjà, avoir une première approximation si euh, la cavéoline va jouer un rôle ou pas dans l'entrée des graisses au niveau du tissu euh, adipeux qui est le tissu de stockage de l'organisme. 
Là, j'ai des différences entre 10 et 20 grammes. C'est presque 25%. Il est possible, à partir de ces tissus adipeux, donc où sont stockées toutes les graisses, d'isoler les cellules qui constituent ce tissu, qui sont les adipocytes, et donc étudier plus précisément les contenus en graisse, en l'absence ou en présence de la cavéoline. On peut imaginer à plus long terme qu'en inhibant ou en activant cette protéine, on va pouvoir jouer sur le stockage des graisses et donc ça peut être des cibles pour des médicaments potentiels ensuite et donc à visée pharmaceutique. I guess, I mean, but it might not be easy because, uh, I mean, first you have to be able to get a stable line, which I found out with HILAS was difficult because the, this construct is really, carbiolin in general, of expression is toxic to cells, so you have to be lucky in a way, and then you have to be able to still differentiate them. Now, if you are that lucky, then... <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah. One important um, area is virus infection. You know, we are talking about influenza virus at the moment. There's not a flu vaccines in the United States. And one day we may get the Spanish flu back that killed millions of people. Uh, 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 more people were killed in the Spanish flu epidemic than in the First World War that came after the First World War. And, and uh, these flu uh, viruses, influenza viruses, they, uh, as you know, it spreads through the air and then uh, you infect your, your lung epithelium and then uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, influenza virus will bud out from this apical membrane that I talked about, this shield, and they use these rafts to come out. Uh, um, another virus in a different way is HIV, AIDS virus. AIDS virus also is a raft virus, uses rafts to get into cells and to get out of cells. I can draw a scheme of a cell where uh, you have two internalization pathways, two different pathways, and um, you can actually use different virus particles to see if one pathway is active or another pathway is active. Because one virus particle, one specific virus, enters via one pathway and another virus enters via another pathway. So, for instance, we can then score by looking at the infection by this virus, whether this pathway is acting, is, is functional, or whether this pathway is functional by looking at the other virus. And uh, the way we do this is we're actually making viruses that when they infect the cell, they express a fluorescent protein. For instance, a red fluorescent protein. So then we're looking at the virus which makes the cells red, or a green fluorescent protein, and we're looking at the virus which makes the cells green. And we can actually then screen in really in large uh, manner. We can look for genes that either block the expression of, of red fluorescence or the expression of green fluorescence. And uh, by that uh, way, we can actually look for all the molecules, all the steps involved in these two distinct pathways. The experiment in which we look at virus infection of cells can be done with a robot, can be completely analyzed with a robot. And this machine, what it does is it targets each gene of the human genome and then this uh, mixture is put onto our cells and in these cells this particular gene is inactivated. Then afterwards, we infect those cells with the virus we want to look at, the green virus or the red virus, and then we can see that if the cell gets infected by the red virus, we can measure this, and then we know, okay, this gene that we just inactivated plays no role in the entry of the virus. If the virus cannot infect, we know this gene plays a role in the entry pathway of this virus. And this we can do, as I said, in a high throughput manner, so we can analyze 25,000 genes and then we know of all human genes which of those genes are involved in the entry pathway of one virus or another. And we use this robot for that. So another disease uh, where, where uh, lipid rafts play a role is in Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a disease where usually old people, but sometimes because of genetic uh, uh, mutants, uh, even younger people can get this disease, and it's a disease where you get plaques in the brain. 
Now, what is the problem? Well, the problem is a cell biological one. You have a protein called the amyloid precursor protein, APP. And in neurons, it goes to the axon and, and can then also be uh, uh, internalized by endocytosis and move to the dendrites. And during this travel of the protein to the cell, it gets cleaved. Here is a cleavage. You cleave out this form and this goes out. And then there's a, a, a fragment left in the membrane. And this so-called amyloid fragment is the one of the two cleavages which is released from this protein, which will then be secreted out of the cell and form these plaques. So now we are trying to understand how this works. And is there any way that we could stop this cleavage?